Welcome everyone to our special tutorial here on medical memory palaces. One of the most common questions I receive on the Medical Numbness podcast is just how to create medical palaces or memory palaces for your medical studies. So here we're going to do a brief tutorial with some graphic representations that should really help solidify the step-by-step -step process a little bit more for your specific medical needs. Now this is coming off of a microbiology bacteriology course that I created back in 2018 and I always wanted to add uh, this mnemonic strategy these memory palaces to the course outline however in a 10 module course and after doing just part of one module I found out it was very time consuming and very resource intensive especially trying to do the back and forth with graphic designers and their expenses and not really understanding what I was trying to have them draw but we're going to use those old images because I did have some made and we'll also cover some of the issues that have arisen since now looking back at them after a lot more experience I noticed some potential weaknesses that you might want to not do so where do we start we're going to want to have a memory palace in mind so a memory palace, as we've discussed in the show, is any place, any scene, any building that you can visualize. Most people want to start with like their homes, their family members' homes, friends' homes, homes that you lived in when you grew up, or maybe libraries, hospitals, offices, any kind of building that you have been in, even a restaurant or coffee shop you frequent. A lot of people even use video games and TV scenes that they're familiar with. It's really just any kind of scene that you can visualize when you close your eyes in great detail and you can place visual markers these visual aids that you create into different locations and then recall them later on so here's a graphic representation this is from a random wikipedia page public domain image of a sketch of a house and i highly recommend that whatever memory polish you're using you sketch them out just for a reference you might also find that you forgot a closet here or a pantry there or something along those lines so Doing this will help you uh, make sure you're on the right track and also use this drawing as a reference point later on when you're doing your rehearsal practice. So your drawing is probably going to look a little closer to this, unless you're an architect or something like that. This is something I sketched up really quick to be a basic representation of my childhood bedroom. So you have the closet, the door, the desk, bookshelves, nightstand, bed. These are all pieces of furniture that most people are going to have plus or minus a few and what this is displaying is this is a macro station the bedroom within the memory palace is your macro station and then all these little areas are your micro stations and they can be these pieces of furniture but they could also be wall fixtures ceiling fixtures windows uh, really anything there that is noticeable that differentiates it from another place I think some people just pick random corners in their room or memory palace and I find that a little more boring. I'd rather them be on pieces of furniture or hanging from a ceiling lamp or something like that. But when we are setting up a plan for our memory palace and memory champions don't really go through this planned process. They just kind of go in and throw stuff around and that's how they develop their very quick abilities to win memory champions. For most of us students, we probably want to plan something out. And you want to consider how many stations you need in this room. How many places are you going to place your visual markers? And is there going to be room to grow later on? Or add on if information changes, if medicine updates, which it does constantly. You might need to go back into your memory palace and change a few things around. So let's go over some basics of visual marker creation. This is the most challenging part for students when they're starting off with these techniques. And I still struggle with it for some aspects, especially in medicine, because the terminology is very variable and very complex and sometimes just not very, you know, innately easy to make an association to. So we're going to use an example because again, this is from the microbiology course that I created, we have a few bugs to use, a few microbes, and these are all going to be in the gram-negative section classification of bacteria. So that aspect we won't really need to add in to these visual markers. In fact, we can just make our macro station, the room that we're going to use, as a room specifically for gram-positive bacteria. So now we've chunked them all together, 
we know what is in there is going to be gram positive, then we don't need to remember which ones are which. Okay, so for creating the first one, we have Staphylococcus aureus, and this is an easy one to come up with a golden staph. Why? Because aureus means gold, and Staphylococcus, well, for most people, I think an actual staff, a walking stick of some sort, is probably going to come to mind. If something else comes to mind for you, perfect. Use it. Whatever comes to mind first, be sure to use. That's probably going to be your personal strongest association. When you listen to others talk about it, as I am now, these are personal to me, or it's whatever popped into my mind first, which is going to be different based on our different experiences and different educations and just different lives in general. So mine are probably going to be mostly arbitrary to you just like yours would be for me, or just like any other pre-made ones would be. So I want you to take away the techniques more so than trying to remember the actual graphics that I have in this presentation. Okay, so some factoids that we probably want to know about this bug, at least for the point of our studies in medical school and up to the step one aspect, and maybe less important after that, would be that it's a complete hemolysis type of bacteria, and that's opposed to a partial or non-hemolytic bacteria. And we also have catalase positive bacteria in Staph aureus. So what can we do with this? Well, for me, the first thing that comes to mind with catalase positive, well, a cat. So for a little kitty, works well. Complete hemolysis. This one was a little tricky. I didn't know if I should pick one word, both words, how to really do this. And I decided that the first thing that popped into my mind for complete ended up being for the visual spectrum of light. So complete being all colors of the spectrum means white. So you put those two together and I have a white cat holding this staff, this golden staff. Again, probably very arbitrary to you. Please pick whatever first comes to your mind and somehow associate that visual mnemonic that you created, that visual image with the topic of the, the staff and making sure it connects to staph aureus. So here I have the cat, the white cat, holding the staff. So I know that this golden staff is associated with the white color and with being catalase positive. Now, there are a few other topics that you might be quizzed in or have run into in your studies for this particular microbe. And if you haven't gotten to this point in your education yet, then these might not make a whole lot of sense as well as the hemolysis and catalase positive part there, but coagulase positive is another enzyme that this particular bug has that you might run into on test questions. And it also has this A toxin. And there's a lot of A toxin, alpha toxin, B toxin, AB toxin, weird stuff like that that are associated with different bugs. So you want to know which toxin is associated with which bacterium. And for the life of me, I can never remember just from a chart or even multiple repetitions it just doesn't stand out. It's not unique enough for the way my mind works. So I wanted to create a visual for this. Coagulase, again, was a little hard for me. I was kind of thinking coagulase is positive. This enzyme breaks up the coagulation you know, aspect of uh, your body and this sort of aggregation of materials. So aggregation for me turned into a synonym, which was congregation, and congregation just brought up a religious aspect in my mind, which gave me an image of a Pope hat. Now, as I'm explaining this, this makes no sense to you, probably, but all this happened within a split second in my mind. So again, whatever comes to you first, just go with it. And on top of that Pope hat, I wanted to make sure that he has the letter A on that hat. So I remember that the A toxin is associated with this whole chunking of material. Now, one mistake I will point out right now, or a potential mistake, is since the main topic or the sort of anchor marker is really supposed to be the staff, the staff aureus staff. So by adding this hat onto the cat, instead of associating it directly with the staff, can potentially be a confusing point for students later on. So I just wanted to point that out. Since I've already sort of gotten used to it with repetitions, it's not that big of a deal for me. But let's move on. So antibiotics that normal staph aureus is, is uh, susceptible to is just plain old penicillin. But of course for MRSA, for the resistant strain, we need something stronger. So vancomycin is generally used, at least right now. When the uh, resistant strains become 
different, then I might have to change this mnemonic in the future. But that's why you have to be very fluid with your visual markers. So what can we do to remember these two bacteria? To remember these two antibiotics, I should say. Well, penicillin, one that I've heard before and that stands out to me, is a pen villain or a pencil villain. So this villainous, menacing creature that has to do with a pen or a pencil kind of shape. And vancomycin, I kind of break it up into three different parts there, vancomycin. So maybe the myosin company, they own a van, and this pencil villain is driving the van. So now we have both of the antibiotics associated together, and if we can associate those with the staff, then we're on a good path. So how are we gonna do that? Well, let's go back to choosing a macro station. Here's just a random image I selected, much nicer than my bedroom looks, so I'm glad I'm not using a picture of that. But we can see here in this macro station that we have a lot of potential micro stations. We can use the nightstands, the bed, the ceiling fan, maybe even those air vents near the roof. We have things on the walls to add them to, a window, a chair, lots of places that we could potentially put things, but we also don't want to get too really uh, complicated there. We don't want to run into a density problem later on. So instead of filling every spot, I think I'm going to start with just the nightstand on the left. And you can do this circular, counterclockwise, clockwise, right to left, whatever makes sense to you. Since these are just being chunked by general category, we don't really need to remember them in order, so the order is not necessarily as important as the fact that all of the gram-positive bacteria are in the same room at least for the way I'm setting this up. So here we have our Staph aureus with the cat, with the coagulase positive hat, with the A protein. And how do we know what is going on with the antibiotics? How do we know if it's resistant to them or if those are effective against this bug? Well, we can display it running over the staff. So with adding this dynamic aspect, with adding this image of or animation of it running over the staff, running over the cat, holding the staff more accurately, then we know that it is victorious in this aspect. It is winning. It is effective against this bacteria versus the other way around. Then we might assume that the staff is resistant to the antibiotics being displayed. So that's how this interaction between the images you create can really form the context behind your memory and your personal palaces. So let's do another example here. So we're still into the Staphylococcus uh, family, is it family genus species? I always get mixed up there, but we're going to go with Staph epidermidis now. So Staph epidermidis, we're still in the Staph aspect, so we want to use some kind of Staph, but it's not going to be this really luscious gold Staph, right? It's kind of just a regular Staph bug. So first thing that pops into my mind is just a regular wooden Staph. So there we go, we have our staff. Now, what are we going to attach to it? Again, we have catalase positive, just like we did in the last one. So we're probably going to reuse the same theme of the cat, but this time it's gamma hemolytic or non-hemolytic versus the complete hemolysis we saw before. So for the sort of chart that I made initially, the gamma, uh, gamma hemolysis came off as a different color. I don't know why I decided to color code each one of these, gamma versus beta versus alpha hemolytic, but that's how it went. And non-hemolytic, so it didn't really change color. It's just a normal, boring color. So when I think of a normal, boring color for a cat, I just kind of think of a brown cat. So now we have a regular looking cat with a regular looking staff, but we have a few other things that we can add to it to make it stand out a little bit more, make them maybe not so boring. First off, Staph epi is known for forming biofilms, so these slimy kind of sludge productions from groupings, from cultures of the bacteria growing on things like urinary catheters. So how do we want to display this slime? Well, can slime the cat. So now we have this green slime everywhere, and we also have this sensitivity, this antibiotic sensitivity to novobiocin. And novobiocin is kind of a tricky one to work with. In fact, a lot of pharmacology is because it's created words by 
pharmaceutical companies. It doesn't have a root. There's not a, a suffix or prefix that we can relate to, such as Latin roots or German roots. So we kind of have to get creative here. And the first thing that the novo part came up in my mind was de novo, which just means in, in a petri dish. And well, it's sensitive to this antibiotic. So nothing's going to grow in the petri dish, right? It's affected by this antibiotic. So we have an empty petri dish that he's standing in. Of course, we have another antibiotic that is going to be used to kill this bug. And that again is going to be vancomycin. But notice we don't have the penicillin villain in this one. So we can't reuse the same image exactly as before, but we can still reuse the van aspect of it. So here we show the van of the myosin company running into the staff and breaking the staff. Here the connection's a little better. It's actually breaking the staff instead of running over the cat. So just to point out again the, the importance of associating these, these linking markers to the anchor marker and not necessarily linking markers to other linking markers. If you want more details on those, you can definitely check out I think it's episode 31 and 3 or 3 and 5 with Lev Golden Touch and a few other of the podcast episodes that we cover these in a little more detail. So let's return to our macro station. This time we're going to choose a micro station of the bed because, well, it's in order. I kind of want to go in order. I like going left to right just like I read. It makes sense to me. So we're going to add this little guy in here. We now have our staff epi bug chilling on the bed and the cat holding them. And remember the bug is the actual staff that he's holding, not the cat itself. So what happens? Well, the van comes ripping through and crashes into the staff and breaks it. Uh, again, the more visual you get, the more creative you get with these, the better they'll stick in your memory. You can make them very elaborate if you want, but don't make them overly elaborate. You just need to make sure that the context is there to some degree. Let's do one more quick example. Let's get away from the staff aspect. So we don't need to have a staff in this image, but Streptococcus agalactiae, or group B strep, GBS. What can we do with this one? Actually, pause the video for a second and think of how many associations you can find for Streptococcus or agalactiae or both. What would you use as your anchor marker for this visual? So, one that I came up with, it's a stretch, and that is not pun intended, but I use Stretch Armstrong because for some reason, for my mind, strep kind of rhymed with stretch, and the first thing that popped into my mind when I said stretch was Stretch Armstrong. For those of you that don't remember this guy, it's a really popular doll back in, I don't know, mid-90s, uh, rubbery, filled with sand. You could stretch him like four times his normal length. Really interesting. A lot of people destroyed them. Um, <laughs> but that's not really going to be sufficient on its own. We need a few other linking markers here to, to really drive home what this image is representing. Uh, first, let's discuss that it's catalase negative also, as you see in parentheses here. So there's no cat in this image. No staff, no cat. Before, it might have been very difficult for you to keep all of these uh, group or gram positive bacteria separate. But now we can notice some very easy to distinguish visuals that are not in certain images. So it'll direct us very easily to one category versus another, or one family versus another. It's also beta hemolytic. So for my scheme, I kind of use beta hemolysis as green. And here's where I made another mistake. In retrospect, I should have colored him green. Uh, he's not colored green. There is green in a later image, which I'll display, but that would have been a stronger association. So another thing to be aware of when you're making these linking markers, once again, you should have them associated with the anchor marker itself and not with other linking markers. Didn't want to hit that already, but since we're here, I also want to remember that it was group B strep. So I really wanted that B to stand out. It's not group A strep, it's not C, D, E, F, G, whatever other ones might exist. It's group B, so we want that B to be in there somewhere, or at least I did for my sake. If you remember that connection very easily, you don't need to add that marker in there. You can have you know, that space used, your mental capacity used for some other task. I also want to remember that it was A. galactiae versus strep pneumonia or other, or viridin strep or something like that. So if you notice the B, you look really close, 
kind of looks like a galaxy in the background. So A Galactiae reminds me of A Galaxy, and that's just a simple little attachment there. So now we actually have three markers that all are attributed to the name. The Stretch Armstrong for Strep, and then the Gala uh, yeah, Galactic B for A Galactiae being Group B Strep. You might think that's overkill, just remember the name and the associations, and that's perfectly fine. Don't use those. Save your visual markers for the part that you have trouble with personally. You do not need to use every single one of them that you're told or seen somewhere else or anything like that. So a few more things to remember. Uh, the camp positive, I always forget what this thing is, and I had to look it up again because it's just not one you see very often, but it would always get me on a couple of questions here and there. So I wanted to add that guy in. And the bacitracin resistant, the novobiosin bacitracin, and one other uh, optichin, I believe, are the, the antibiotics that we often test for to see what grows in a petri dish when those are there. And it'll kind of allow us to know if it's sensitive to this or resistant to that, guide us in a direction of one bug or another. So they're kind of important to know. Probably never going to use it clinically, but for testing, you should remember it. And what is this going to be depicted as in this visual marker? Well, camp. What comes to mind if you see camp? Maybe a tent? So we have a tent here. We have a green tent, so that's where the beta hemolysis comes in. Again, it was attached to a linking marker instead of the anchor marker, so potential weak point there to look out for. And camp is this arrow-shaped hemolysis. So that's why the tent looks kind of like an arrow. It's a very tall tent. It has these points sticking out of it. So the camp arrow-shaped hemolysis and green beta hemolytic hemolysis kind of wrap into that one image there. We also have the basitrace and basitracin, I apologize, resistant bacteria here. So what's the uh, brand name in the US is Neosporin, and we want to show that GBS is resistant to it. So it's stronger than the antibiotic. So we kind of see this puny Neosporin tube. It's all wrapped up. It's kind of pathetic looking. It's not going to have much effect on our big old Stretch Armstrong here, is it? because stretch is resistant to it. And again, we have penicillin. So where is our pencil villain or pen villain? You can use them interchangeably. Here we see a pen villain kind of sneaking out from behind the, the tent there. You know that it is going to be resistant because it doesn't look puny. It's going to have some effect on this GBS guy. So adding our last one in here, let's just put them on the chair over here. All right, there we go. So now just with these three micro stations in this one macro station in one single uh, memory palace, we have what, 15, 20 different associations. We have the golden staff. We have catalase positive. We have that it's complete hemolysis. We have the coagulase positive with the hat, the protein A, the penicillin and banco that affect it, and another four or five with the strip or yeah, staph epidermidis, and then another four, five, six over here with GBS. So just there, we have a ton of potential mnemonics or potential associations that we can make with these mnemonics. And we have a lot more room in this room if we wanted to. We could put stuff on every shelf and every corner and every knickknack, but we do want to watch out for that density problem. We want to make sure that there's room to grow later on. So you can also, as you stated, I think in the first slide, you can connect memory palaces as well. You can connect your house to a library, to a school, and now you have hundreds of macro stations, all with a handful of micro stations to use. Each micro station can house a handful of different associations. So you can see how powerful this can be. You really just need to find out where to start, and hopefully this will be a good guide to get you started. So I hope you enjoyed this brief tutorial. It takes infinitely longer to explain these in detail than it does to come up with your own. And all you have to do is practice a few days. Generally, I like to do a few minutes every morning, and you'll be surprised how quickly these will start to develop. And as you start building your visual dictionary, you build these characters that you can reuse in different scenes and in different contexts, then it becomes that much quicker. And some might not be that strong at first, and you might have to change them up. You might make mistakes like I did in this one, and that's fine. These have to be flexible. Um, just 
really emphasize trying to put them into practice and not doing it for everything. You don't need a memory palace with every factoid that you run across in your textbook. Use it for the difficult materials. Really focus on those. Then you can always add to it later, but then you're not overloading yourself and taking too much time trying to make these for every mnemonic. Please do add any mental images, any markers to your rehearsal practice. You can use the little drawing, the sketch that you did. If you can't draw any better than stick figures like me, that's perfectly fine. You can actually just type it out or write out what goes where in a, a brief description, just so you have something to come back to. Let's say you don't rehearse it for a couple of days. You're like, crap, I don't remember what was on the bed. Well, now you have a reference point to test yourself against. And if you want to learn more about these materials, of course, I would recommend checking out the other Medical Nemesis podcasts and all of our content on freemeded.org. We also have the One Minute Preceptor podcast, which is really guided towards those going into clinical practice, and namely after step one for the most part. And anyone that is pre-step one, this is whether you're in school or before med school, you might want to check out Read This Before Medical School. We cover a lot of topics like this and study efficiency and so much more. You can also download our free essentials PDF at freemeded.org slash medstudent, and that'll give you a little taste of some of the material in the book, just a couple of pages to get you uh, somewhat familiar with what we'll cover. Do subscribe to this channel because we don't know how frequently these will come out. If uh, you miss them, that's really not going to be fun. These are really cool videos. I hope you enjoy it. I enjoyed making it, and do join up. If you have any skills you'd like to offer, if you can make some graphic designs, then I could come out with these much more frequently. So doing this for you guys, let me know if you like anything, if you used any of these in the past, or if you're having trouble with any of them, just jot them down, write them in the comments in the video below. Uh, hope to hear from you soon, and feel free to reach out with any questions you might have.